Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. HPU's call to action is choose to be extraordinary. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Was the threat of a Y2K meltdown really 20 years ago? Were we in the middle of the Great Recession 10 years ago? And now are we really experiencing the longest economic expansion in U.S. history since Reconstruction in the South? Wow. Happy New Year. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William. And as we start these two special installments of Carolina Business Review, we will reflect on the year that was in 2019, both from a business and policy perspective, but also part two next week, we'll take a look ahead. How long will this expansion continue, really? What are some of those landmines, unexpected events that could disrupt? And how does policy and community affairs factor into all of it? In a moment, we will start with our four resident economists, who we will enjoy in just a moment. Stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. This is the Carolina Business Review Annual Economic Year in Review, featuring Sarah House of Wells Fargo Securities, Dr. John Connaughton of UNC Charlotte, Dr. Doug Woodward from the University of South Carolina, and Dr. Frank Hefner of the College of Charleston. Happy New Year, happy holidays. Welcome to the dialogue. It's good to have you all four back again. It's great nice to, be to be here. The rumor is among the staff that this is our favorite show, so there's no <laughs> pressure. Um, Sarah, let's start with you. Um, what one word would you use to describe our current economic situation? I would say uncertain. So we've seen this past year a lot of uncertainty, specifically surrounding trade, but really how the economy is going to fare in this situation. So how monetary policymakers are going to respond, how businesses are, are going to respond. It's really a situation we haven't seen for, for many, many decades. Doug, what one word? Resilient. It just keeps coming back. You can't knock it down. Um, you know, the trade war, uh, inverted yield curves, everybody says a recession's coming, but you know, at the end of the year, uh, we had great job numbers and people saying, wow, it just keeps going. You know, this expansion, the longest, as you said before, in history, uh, or at least uh, that we know about. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, it looks like it's going to continue. So it, it's, it's just a resilient economy. Frank, John? Well, I was going to say resilient energy bun uh, bunny, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to stick with. You know, that's not one word. I got that. <laughs> and I'm going on. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Co confusing and confounding. And, and that's still not one word, Frank. <laughs> <know that>. Confounding. <laughs> Dang it. Conflate those two. Because, and Doug hit it on the nail because a lot of these things, uh, yes, the traditional view of the inverted yield curve, it, it just hasn't happened. Uh, how, what happened to the Phillips curve, for gosh sake? I mean, we now have incredibly low inflation, incredibly low unemployment rates. So all metrics that we used to use. So you're talking about things that happened 20 years ago. If we use those models right now to, to explain what's happening today, we can't because it's just too confusing. One word, John. Trumpian. Is that a word? It is now. It is now. <laughs> not in Scrabble. Yeah, not in Scrabble. Uh, I cannot remember um, 
any time when a president has had his finger in the economy in more ways than this president has. Everything from the trade war with pick the country, pick the region, influencing the Fed to drop interest rates by 75 basis points this year. Um, it's amazing, but he's had more input in the economy than presidents typically have. Wow. Through Twitter. Twitter. It's a Twitter <laughs> economy. Well, There's our word. Right. Doug, it, Twitter. Do, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It ma yeah. What matters is that he's had an influence on this year's economy in a way that I've not seen another president in my professional experience. So do you think that the, the, the occupant of the Oval Office has extended the expansion, or do you think that, and it, it, it's not that I don't want to make it about the president, it, it, he has influence on it. I think what I'm trying to get to at the top of the program here is what is keeping this economy, has the Fed found that magical nirvana balance in the economy to hit it just perfectly right? It's not a soft landing, it's not expanding, it's just doing this thing. I just want I've to say got one thing my about word, thanks to Doug. Yeah. Twitter painted. <laughs> yeah. That is the word that describes the economy. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug. <laughs> well, another word is the, uh, proactive. That's what yeah. the Fed is now. I mean, they're right. looking forward. They used to be reactive, you know, and, and we'd get into a crisis and then they're putting together rescue packages and bailouts. Mm -hmm. Now they're looking forward. And, and in 2019, I know, so, you know, they intervened in the repo market to get that right, you know, uh, with liquidity. They reversed this inverted yield curve, brought the short term rates down when nobody else, you know, th really thought that that, that was in the cards for them, but they're, they're, they're looking more forward than they ever have before. So I think they're not reacting. They're, 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 um, they're proactive. Um, I do want to disclose this uh, before we get too far into the program. Uh, Sarah House is with Wells Fargo, uh, and I've been an employee of Wells Fargo for 30 years now in the interest of full disclosure. Sarah, let, let me come back to something. Mm -hmm. Has the Fed found that magical balance, or has the Fed just happened to be driving the bus? And that's a little bit too discounting, but is, it, is the Fed responsible for where we are? I think the Fed has certainly helped over this, this year, um, particularly in the second half of the year where we have seen financial conditions ease as the Fed has as the Fed has cut rates again. And so I think that's helped extend the expansion and help with some of this uncertainty that we continue to face in, in the environment. I think whether it's the perfectly magic number, um, hard to pin down, and so something we probably won't be able to say for a long time. I mean, there are some risks with this easing by that the Fed has had over this past year, including uh, potential for financial imbalances mm -hmm. later on down the road. But right now, things look look pretty good. And, and even with those potential imbalances, we're still not really seeing them. We know that imbalances, and I'm telling you all something you fundamentally learned in Econ 101, but we know that imbalances lead to recessions or slowdowns, however you want to describe it. John, what, what two conditions have, what are two prominent conditions that cause us to go into recessions? Well, there are two things, sort of two sides of this issue. One is endogenous factors. We've been talking about those, such things as what happens to business confidence and if, in, if investment starts to tail off like it did in the second quarter. We had about a 6% decline in uh, gross private domestic investment. Third quarter was flat, so that didn't last very long. And we've seen one quarter before drop down, even two quarters drop down. It takes usually three or four quarters of drop down in investment. So business confidence is one. On the, and another endogenous factor is obviously consumer confidence, which is still high. It's not as high as it was a year ago, but it's still pretty high relative. Mm -hmm. But there are also exogenous factors that can cause the shocks. We've seen energy shocks cause uh, recessions before. Uh, we've seen war basically cause that. Um, we've seen commodity price intervene in the economy and cause those kinds of things. So there are really two avenues that can cause this. But when we look at those things right now, we really don't see any of them that are problematic. I mean, I, I got to remind the audience here, we are in the 126th month of economic, uninterrupted economic expansion. You say so, that like that's a, uh, it's a record. Uh, it the is. previous record was 120 months in the 90s, uh, mm -hmm. and this is 126, but we also, and this goes back to what you, you talked about a little earlier in terms of the uncertainty and stuff. One of the, there's this, this is almost a belief that, well, because we've been going so long, it has to come to an end. And that's just simply not true. Uh, we talked about proactive Fed. Um, that's that's a, this isn't your dad's Fed anymore. 
This is the great expansion. This is, you know, we had the great recession. I think in history, they're going to look back at this time, and that's what right. they're going to call it with capital G, capital E, great expansion. So, so we equal, always equal and opposite reaction, mm -hmm. as, as engineers will put it. Look, you yeah. think it's a great expansion because of the great recession? No. No. Well, no, no. no. Uh, well, to some no, degree, no. I think we they learned a they lot learned, uh, yeah. during the great recession. They said, we can't let this happen again and go into crisis mode and let things build up and, mm -hmm. and raise rates going into a slow economy. I mean, they learned a lot. They're not doing that now. I'm talking about the Federal yeah, Reserve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so from that point of view, I think they deserve a lot of credit from the 2008, 2009. They learned those lessons and they're applying them now. And this is why a lot of people are looking at uh, the facts is that is, it, is, it is unheard of. Since it's unheard of, how do we explain it? And, and we're still struggling with those kind of issues. Um, I mean, I think the exogenous factors are probably going to be more important than some of the endogenous. Uh, consumer confidence, yes, but they keep spending because jobs be, keep growing. And, and, and right, the sheets. fundamentals are, are, mm. are good, and yeah. I think that's yes. what lends itself right. where, yes, it's the longest, but it can go on because, well, you never know what sort of shock you might get, but those endogenous factors that John talked about are really strong. There, there is a lot of wherewithal on the part of consumers. Um, businesses have been cautious, but, and yes, they have a lot of debt, but other factors on their balance sheet also look they have pretty, a lot of pretty cash. strong. And yeah. exactly. let, let me have a lot of cash. plug in to say that we're kind of skirting around what's going to happen based on what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about right before the, the cameras came on, is the idea that we can't we can't talk about where we were if we don't know where we're going. We're going to talk about where we're going on next week's installment of the program. But I want to come back to this idea, and it's human nature. Whenever anything is is turns into a status quo, and we could call as you described it, John, this economy is now status quo. Mm -hmm. It's expanding, 10th, 11th year, now we entered the 11th year. Isn't there a sense of complacency in the economy? I, I don't think so, um, but, but I want to go back to try to help people understand where we are on this and what, what has fundamentally changed. Um, and, and I think that, A, it's, yeah, it's the longest, but if you look at the last four expansions, there are there one, two, three, four in terms of longest expansions, truly, Despite the Fed changing and being more proactive, for the last, I would say, four decades, the Fed has been much more influential in the economy and much more effective in expanding uh, the length of expansion. So they're getting better at they're it. They're getting a hell of a lot better at it. You know, you go back to the, I know, <laughs> you remember this, the late 19th century? Uh, <laughs> it's you pretty know, chilly. Yeah, when you, when, you, when you start looking at expansions and recessions then, there was about two years of an expansion followed by two years of recession. Right. And that, that's kind of the, and then it got a little bit better in the first half of the 20th century, but in the second half of the 20th century is really when monetary policy really started to take in effect and really change the dynamics of how long these expansions last and how short the recessions are. And I, I think so, it also plays into the, that the structure of the economy has changed as we become oh, more yeah. service oriented, that we don't see as much volatility in that sector like we do in the industrial sector, which has been one of the, the weak spots of this past year. Yeah. So I'd but, like to emphasize on that because this, this idea that negative interest rates is the uh, solves all the problems. Europe has shown us that negative interest rates do not solve structural problems in the economy. So the way the structures change, as you brought up, is very important to what's... Mm -hmm. looked. So we're going to have to start looking at more how do things flow in the economy? What, what's actually going on rather than uh, sort of a flow of funds approach or a modeling approach? So well, things are different now. Things yeah. are different now than they were 20 years ago. I think it's great people are complacent. It's better than being irrationally exuberant yes. or unduly pessimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, yeah, so I think complacent's good unless people are not paying attention to the problems that do cause recessions and, for example, rising debt levels that are unsustainable. We're not seeing that right now on the corporate side. It's starting to build up or the consumer side. But at some point, they're going to make riskier and riskier loans and we're not going to pay attention to that and then we're going to have a problem. Uh, a complacency right now so, is, is okay. Okay, well, let me, let me take it in another direction. I want to come back <laughs> to the idea of monetary policy because we're not, all of these things don't happen without fiscal and monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And if we get fiscal, if we get monetary policy right, which, as you argued, they may be getting better at it, and I'm talking about the Fed. Fiscal policy is is still a bit of a rub, is it not? I mean, we've only had um, we had you know the reinvestment and recovery act back in 2009 to try to get us out of the recession. It was marginally effective. I don't think it'll when we look back at it, I don't think we'll see that it was particularly effective. Uh, I think that quantitative easing had much bigger impact on moving the economy forward. Then. And you're not worried about all that debt because of 
quantitative easing? Well, you know, this, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, is projecting that by 2028 we'll be back at a trillion and a half dollars of mm -hmm. debt. But we'll also probably be in a $30 trillion right. dollar economy by then as well. So um, is, is it problematic? Yeah. But even where we are in our debt, there are lots of countries that have much higher debt to GDP, GDP ratios than we do. Well, uh, we hit 100 percent. Japan's at 200 percent right now. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. What, well, Sarah, uh, demographics, when we look at the Carolinas and we're looking now as we're talking about this, uh, this, this expansion where we are, how, how has the demographics changed over the last 24, 36 months? Well, I think in terms of, of here in the Carolinas, I mean, you continue to see an influx of, of people from other parts of the mm -hmm. country, many of them on the younger side. Um, so I think that's been a great thing for our area is that the affordable cost of living compared to a lot of other places on the coast has, has attracted a, mm -hmm. a young workforce in, in the Carolinas. And I think that, that's a great, does that, great development. Does that in migration of all demographics, mm -hmm. all ages, does that bail us out from making bad choices when it comes to economic development or or even 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 economic choices it, it doesn't necessarily bail you out but it is an underlying support if you have growing population to support spending pledges that we've seen in in the fiscal arena but it's also your your workforce and your local source of, of spending and so it can be a, a really great generator for for the underlying mm -hmm. rate of growth here mm -hmm. about demographics I just like to add we've, we've looked at this during the great expansion beginning in 2009 up through now. In South Carolina, I'm sure it's true in North Carolina, we're getting an increasing share of our population with college degrees, and that's that's a positive sign. Mm -hmm. The workforce uh, skill levels are improving, so we're not just attracting people who are not going to be contributing to the economy. We are actually growing the population that will be in the future. What, what it is doing, though, I think, is it could help us make bad decisions. In the sense, for example, I'll pick on South Carolina, uh, a, a huge windfall in, uh, in uh, general revenue funds this year. So from from all sorts of taxes that uh, were anticipated and also uh, the winner of the mega lottery popped in another $50 million in terms of uh, income tax, which the governor wisely disseminated $50 checks around the state to people. Um, are you being facetious? Was that, yes. I didn't get no, one. No, 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 no. No, no, are you being facetious <laughs> about the way Governor McMaster Yes, I that? am, because <laughs> that avoids all the difficult problems of uh -huh. infrastructure, the pension fund that we're kicking down the uh, line is, be, is fundamentally got severe problems, but instead of dealing with these things, they're going to use it to deal with other issues. And those just get pushed down the line. And uh, with John, in one sense, you know, these are big issues and they're so big that we're not, we may not deal with them, but at some point they're going to come back and haunt us. Who's ever going to figure that out? I don't know. But we clearly have infrastructure problems in South Carolina that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to come, come, come back to the demographics, and there's an overriding problem that we're, we realize, but we're really not talking about very much, and that is we have stagnant growth in our labor force nationally, not so much in the Carolinas because we do still have some in-migration, mm -hmm. but nationally, um, the age group, 60 to 64, age cohort, that's now in the process of leaving the, the, the labor force, is being replaced by a smaller group, by about a million people. Okay, so the 15 and 19 year olds that are starting to enter the labor force are, is a smaller cohort. I think it's 22 million to 21 million. So we're actually having a shrinking in our labor force. And you know, there's only two things that cause economic growth, growth in the labor force and growth in productivity. And if your labor force is stagnant, mm -hmm. as it is in Germany, as it is in Japan, this is what's driving this 2% growth that we, we, t we have had during this expansion and we are going to continue to have going forward. I've talked about the CBO projections on um, a budget deficit. They also do projections on GDP, and their average, their average annual growth rate over the next 10 years for GDP is 1.9%, and it's being driven by the fact that the labor force is stagnant. <laughs> Just one last thing on top of that. Obviously, to counter that, you, we could have productivity growth. The problem is productivity growth has been flat this year. But as we look at this past year, I think one of the areas of strength we've seen is an increase in labor force participation, and so that mm. can help offset you mean that, that slowing population. You mean folks that weren't even growth. looking before have right. now so decided they're going to reach you in, into the into the workforce. So that can offset some of the slowdown in the population dynamics that the country is struggling with mm. as a whole. And I think that's really one of the benefits we've seen of, of this strong labor market is it is attracting mm. more workers into the workforce, and that's helping keep the the labor force growth for now steady, which is at least um, helping augment 
augment some of that soft productivity and backdrop. I want to yeah. come back to this real quickly no. about the productivity. I'm still a believer that we're going to see a new wave of technology coming in. And you don't believe this, but the, the technology is out there. AI, machine learning, it's affecting all industries. I don't know that we'll need the demand for uh, growth in uh, labor. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a tight labor market, but I think it's, it's in a way it's a good thing that the population, uh, the labor force is going to slow down because I think automation is, is really going to and reduce a, a lot of uh, Good thing, as you pointed out, they're coming into the Carolinas with college degrees. Yeah. Because the assembly line of today now requires a college degree. More people in manufacturing the, need a college degree, have a college degree now right. than don't. Let, uh, let me get a question about education because there's been yes. a huge push in the State House in, in Columbia, as well as in Raleigh, around reforming K through 12 mm -hmm. and really trying to get that right. So on the other side, and don't roll your eyes, because you're in higher education. You know, it's coming down the line to you. <laughs> um, th th this idea of getting, of getting two million uh, college level degrees by 2030. And, and my future NC has a whole other plan in North Carolina. And of course, yeah. finally, the, the Senate in South Carolina has proposed some great idea around education reform. It, will it be enough? Is it, is it, it's not going to be enough, but will there be enough good education policy to backfill some of these issues that you've referred to? Well, well, it depends on what kind of degrees they're getting. That, that's yeah. that's yeah. one issue. And what kind of uh, counseling they're getting on that. And the other one is I'm still a firm believer in uh, two-year associate degrees to prepare people for a lot of jobs that require post-secondary education. To figure out where yeah. to go after that. Right. They may not need Western civilization as a, as a general education okay. course, but they do need a lot of other skills. I don't want to get too forward-looking yeah. on education, but I, I'm talking about the education reform that's happened to date. Are you encouraged by it? I, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I mean, I think um, actually our education system is pretty good. If you want it, you can get a good degree. We have a lot mm -hmm. of options, a lot of flexibility. I just uh, met someone, a mother whose kid had 16 AP courses. These are available. If you want it, you can go out there and get that education. Not everybody does. I know because my wife was a teacher for many, many years, and she taught in the ninth grade where they're trying to put everybody in public college. School? Yeah, in public school. Put everybody on college track, and not everybody really should be going in that direction. I'll tell you, 50% of the people, they should be going into a two-year program mm -hmm. or something like that, but they wanted everybody to take Spanish and you know higher level math and everything, and they this is just not, they weren't uh, prepared for that. They didn't even have the soft skills doing the homework and showing. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, what we call soft skills. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're yeah. doing, <laughs> being responsible and showing up on time, we, and that kind of thing. But as is, I pointed out to one uh, f family, who actually they pointed out to me, they, they did spot, his son did spot welding. Spot welding is not going to be offshored because yeah. it's got to be done sure. here. And, and it pays very, very, very uh, we have, well. We have two minutes, about yeah. three minutes left. Hold on, John, because I, I, I want to start with you yeah. on this one. Commercial real estate, residential real estate. When you look back in the last 12 months, you go back even farther, it has been hot. You talk about mm -hmm. tight labor market. Prices are are going higher and higher in central, you're not, you're what, you're not, you don't agree with The that? Schiller Index for the past year for nationally in the 20 city composites only up a little over 2%. Forget about 20 cities, what about the Carolinas? Uh, Charlotte's up 4.7%, I suspect Raleigh's up about the same, uh, over the same period of time. And one of the hottest metros but, in the- But in terms of the overall market, and that's if you're looking at, you know, speculation and problems, nationally it's it's right in line with the with the rate of inflation. What about places like the low country? Well, low country's booming, and one of our biggest problems there is good luck finding the uh, contractors that can do the work because mm -hmm. we have severe skill set shortages there and uh, labor shortages. Um, prices are still, uh, we keep building, but they don't keep edging down. I mean, when you start seeing off away from downtown Charleston, affordable housing starting at 350, you sort of wonder, well, okay, who's coming into the market mm -hmm. for that kind of uh, market? <clears throat> so um, th there are some issues. I think that uh, w my concern on this, just to touch base on that, is the uh, apartment building. Uh, boom. Apartment uh, homes. Apartment homes, yes. Uh, there, there may be in some select markets uh, a little bit too much. And then also hotels is another possibility. Is that, is that specific, though, to the urban cores? 
the apartment, the overheating in the apartment building? Well, we've seen some more uh, multifamily construction go out further in from the urban cores, just as as you know density has gotten stronger, and there's just been you know there's still a lot of demand. So it's it's in part just d the demographics where you mm -hmm. still have a lot of young people in their prime prime renting years. Mm -hmm. um, you know the single family market's still in many ways um, un unaffordable for a lot of households, and so we have seen some expansion out kind of further in towards the suburbs, um, but still you're seeing a lot of it in, in more of the urbanized. The other thing about Or just given shift, shift in prefer preferences. Yeah. As you point out in the demographics, that younger crowd doesn't see themselves as being stationary. Mm -hmm. So renting is a very viable option for them. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate, we have less than a minute left. Yeah. Commercial real estate surprised you how strong it was? No, the economy's good. I mm -hmm. would yeah. expect commercial real estate to uh, mm -hmm. rise with the overall economic conditions yeah. improving. No, I don't think it's a problem at this point in time. I, the, the, only, the only little problem that's out there in terms of debt is, of course, student loan. And I was mm. going to kind of follow up well, on... Well, guess what? You're, you know, you're pretty good at that because we're actually going to talk about student loan forward-looking on next week's program. But back to the commercial. The we don't have time for you to go back to anything. <laughs> Dr. Heffern, I'll look <laughs> forward to that. Except to Charleston. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good to have you here, John. Nice to see you here. Sarah, welcome Thanks. back. Uh, always to be have, here. nice to have you, Doug. Uh, thank you for watching our program. Happy New Year. It's hard to believe the turn of another year, 2020. Uh, we hope the best for you. I hope you have a good weekend and a happy holiday. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.